This is Speaking of Shakespeare, a series of conversations about things Shakespearean, with a focus on new digital technologies and also about developments in Shakespeare performance and education across the globe. I'm Thomas Dabbs, recording this introduction from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. What follows is a conversation with John Yamamoto Wilson, recently retired from Sofia University in Tokyo. We are going to discuss John's recent book on pain, pleasure, and perversity in 17th century England, and also talk a bit about his pedagogical and instructional website entitled Ano Sensei. Before we begin, I should add that this conversation is made possible with the help of institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University. This series is also funded by a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science called Kaken. And this organization, thankfully, includes support for research in the humanities. Good afternoon, John. Yamamoto Wilson, how are you? It's so good to see you and to see that you're well and um, I'm, I'm almost well. I've been, uh, we were talking uh, before we shot about uh, how the air in Tokyo, there's a lot of pollen in the air and it's sort of affected us. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so anytime you don't feel 100% these days, you uh, feel like, oh no, maybe, you know, it's, it's the big corona or something like that, but uh, I'm not running any temperature or anything and you're well too. Yes, apart from, as you say, the yearly uh, pollen, hay fever problems. Yes, <laughs> I'm fine. I wanted to start out with uh, just mentioning your book uh, from Ashgate. Is that, that's right, Ashgate. Public. It was Ashgate at the time, yes. I, I, it's, and now it's Rutledge. It's Rutledge now, now Rutledge, yes. Yeah, uh, they picked it up. And look yeah. at that, what a wonderful cover. It's a little bit scary, actually. Pain, Pleasure, and Perversity. <laughs> Discourses of Suffering in 17th Century England. And so the book has a lot of suffering in it. And also it's become more topical now. Tell us a little bit about it, what it goes into. Okay, well, there is a story behind the cover. Having my interest in early modern books, I have something called Clark's Martyrology. And excuse my squeaking chair just back there when I swiveled around. You'll, you'll see uh, it's got the same lurid illustrations so I actually yeah. created this cover myself. Yeah, or early graphic novels, uh, even though it's not <laughs> a novel, but it kind of is because a, a lot of those, I don't know much about Clark's, but there might be some fiction in there blended with other things that are historically accurate. Yeah, he's aiming for historical accuracy. He's writing it from, from a Puritan kind of point of view. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I had a thing with the publisher, actually got them to, to put uh, more of these lurid pictures on the inside cover as well. So I was yeah. pleased with the way it looked and um, yeah, uh, mortified to find that there was a, a mistake on the very first page. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, not many people will notice, you know, but I we don't think will. anybody would notice because it boils down to the fact that in the first edition of his book, the, the particular 17th century, not very well known author that I was referring to, talks about Catholics going through the street in mortification in uh, early Stuart England mm. and mortifying themselves publicly. And then in the second edition, as I subsequently realized, he corrects himself and says, no, they didn't actually go through the, they morti they went to somebody's house house they went to a private place and they mortified themselves there so he he backtracked on what he'd written in the first edition um but obviously i think it's pretty much the sort of thing that would happen that uh, hearing that the catholics had uh, gone barefoot through the streets um uh, you know on, on that they, they, the assumption would be that they'd mortified themselves as they were going through the streets um, he corrects himself and tells us that, which surprised me, you know, yeah. they, that that would have happened in, in uh, England at that time. But no, yeah. they'd gone to a private house as he subsequently corrects himself in yeah. the second edition. 
So this is part of, well, I guess maybe the origin is Fox. Clark uh, does take quite a lot of his stuff from Fox. And um... and these are hagiographies. These, these are Protestant, uh, yeah, uh, he, Protestant he... efforts to replace the canon of saints in the Roman church with a S new canon. Some, something yeah. like that, yes. yes. Um, obviously, you know, it's difficult with it. when it comes to the early Christians, there's not going to be a particular, there's the man himself, oh um, my. there's not going to be a particular, obviously a distinction, unless, until, except when he goes into kind of things like the, Vol the Volvensians or something like that. There's yeah. not a particular distinction between early Christian martyrs of, well, there, 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 there weren't any denominations as such from that point of view. I mean, if you're looking at what Romans were doing to Christians or something like that, which he... Yeah talks about in the beginning there's a there, there are catholic martyrologies as well of course and uh yeah well in your in stuff. your book in your book you talk a lot about the converse the uh the torturing and the uh suffering of people who remained loyal to the roman church uh during that period and and generally about suffering right well i mean what, what actually sparked it off was the uh initial research that I did in Cambridge on translations from Catholic and Catholic editions in appearing in Protestant England in the early modern period, one of the things that emerged was that obviously you've got you know, doctrinal differences, but there's a whole different attitude towards suffering which hadn't really, I think, been dragged out into the open and examined under the microscope. And when I was fortunate enough to get a sabbatical, which I did about six or seven years before I retired, I spent it in the UL and the University Library at Cambridge, um, developing that topic. And it, it was fascinating. I had a, a very happy year cycling down to the library through rain, wind, <laughs> sleet or snow uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I was a very familiar figure there. Mm. And, Be uh, beautiful English weather. <laughs> oh, oh, tell me about it. <laughs> um, well, that's right. You did your work at Cambridge and you, uh, your career as an educator uh, and scholar was at Sophia University. And for our listeners who may not know, Sophia University is uh, a Jesuit. It is part of the Catholic Church, but it's a Jesuit university. In our other conversations, I don't think, are you, you are, you're not a practicing Catholic, are you? I'm not a Catholic at all. No, I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Protestant. I'm not anything. Yeah. My, my mother was a fairly devout Catholic in my early childhood. And then as it was coming up to kind of, I was the eldest son, as it was coming up to my first communion, she, uh, she got cold feet about the whole thing. Huh. Yeah. Uh, again, um, suffering. She suffering. felt that people should not be brought, it wasn't the way to be bringing up children, to be uh, afraid of hellfire and, and, and always being threatened with, with being, you know, burned in hell for eternity. She just didn't, she couldn't really buy it. And my father was one of those, you know, twice a year Anglicans go to the church at Easter and Christmas and who, as, you know, an, a, a, an academic intellectual himself would raise all kinds of issues with my mother, which were quite interesting debates on country walks about how there'd been two popes fighting each other. So how could they possibly you know, <laughs> claim um, authority, you know, uh, to have a sort of, um, yeah, authority, that sort of issue. Um, so I kind of grew up with an interest in those sorts of things, but I never, yeah, was personally, unlike, say, Father Millwood at, at the same, at Sophia, we're talking about Sophia University here in Tokyo, of course, just, just yeah. in case people are not sure, people are thinking of somewhere uh, else. Um, yes, I should have made that clear. Well, we were going to do uh, Peter Mill Millward uh, a little bit later, perhaps, but oh, okay. we can go ahead now. Let's let's talk about let's talk about uh, Peter Millward. Uh, yeah, the uh, Sophia University in Tokyo, and uh, and Peter Millward. Yes, he retired from the department just as I joined it. So I had been at Sophia for three years 
in the in a, in a language section where I'd been brought in with I think the the idea was that give, give him a couple of literature classes and see how he gets on we know we've got a post coming up in a couple of years time let's see if he's suited for it so that's what they did they had me teaching languages I, I had a background in linguistics as well as in literature so uh, I covered all their bases and then I moved into the English literature department just as he was retiring from it but of course as a Jesuit he lived on the campus and not only that but in those days there was a Renaissance Institute and a Renaissance Center. The Renaissance Center was a, a physical room inside the university library and the Institute held yearly conferences and lecture courses from time to time and that sort of, both of them have gone now. Mm. They don't exist anymore. Mm. But at that time, I had quite a lot of interaction with him because you know we had a shared interest in all of that. Mm. And so I suppose that's something that brought me into thinking about Shakespeare from a more academic point of view, his insistence that Shakespeare must have been Catholic. Yes. Uh, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't personally buy it. I mean, obviously he wasn't a papist. I mean, in the overt sense, it's possible that he was a, what they called a church, what they, they're now calling a church papist. Uh, that term has gained some, um, circulation. Uh, someone who kept quiet about it, basically was a Catholic, but shut up and went to church just to keep kind of keep the peace and not get himself into trouble. Um, and of course, there are things like Empson from my old college at uh, Magdalen, uh, Empson, the, 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 the critic, yeah. he was, I think, the first person to pick out what Shakespeare was talking about when he uh, talks about the, um, the those ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. And he is, of course, he is undoubtedly talking about, undoubtedly talking about the dissolution of the monasteries. He was earlier than my day, obviously. Yeah, but um, his spirit is still there. He's still there in spirit very much. And, uh, he, he's right. I mean, there's no question about it. Shakespeare is, you know, ostensibly regretting the passing of a way of, of, of the passing of the monasteries, the closure of the monasteries, those ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Yeah. Um, but I think Father Millwood assumes a commitment or feels there's a commitment where we don't necessarily have to see such a commitment. Poets in, engage, they, they do, they engage the feelings, they engage the emotions. Um, and then, if, of course, if you take him out of context, you can, which I, I'm sorry to say, but I felt Father Millwood frequently did, um, it, it would be things like, uh, I must hold my tongue. He's talking about the fact that he has to shut up, his, he has to stop complaining openly about the death of his father, because uh, it could be politically dangerous for him to show his dissatisfaction and discontent at what seems to be going on. Um, he needs to play it safe. And this is Shakespeare, not Millward. This is Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare. Yeah. But, yeah, yes, but Millward, yeah. Millward takes it out of context and has published several times. He's used that particular quote as saying that uh, he, he's, he's trying to say that, you know, he, he believes in Catholicism, but in context, he's not saying that anything, anything, anything even remotely of the sort. And th those were the kinds of <laughs> always very agreeable discussions that uh, Peter Millward and I would have. Uh, in the Renaissance Center or later on in his in the Jesuit um, Center, uh, SJ House, um, about that kind of thing. What a wonderful opportunity to be able to discuss these things uh, as part of your um, your participation in the academic community and to have a scholar. He was quite uh, he's quite I'm not sure if he's still alive. I... No, no, no. He died a few years ago. Yeah, but the okay. question of his death, uh, <laughs> there's an interesting story where he appeared at a conference a few years ago uh, before he died, well, obviously. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't know who was giving the uh, presentation, 
uh, started saying, but of course, all of these ideas of Peter Millward and blah, 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 and people like that. And he stood up and said, I am Peter Millward. <laughs> and the, the man's jaw hitting the ground. I heard this from Joseph O'Leary, the man's jaw hitting the ground because I thought you died years ago. <laughs> Well, he did. He lived a very long life and a very active life. Yeah. Right up until the end, he was writing, publishing. And um, he, he amassed quite a collection that I'm yeah. not sure if that's still held by uh, Sophia or I heard that it was acquired by Harvard. And I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So I heard that from another source. It might be completely... Uh, the last I heard, the Peter Millwood collection was the only named separate collection inside Sophia Library. And uh, it was a wonderful collection of books on the Renaissance the, and the Reformation period uh, that had been previously in the Renaissance Centre. And like other centers, they'd been an early, they'd been a medieval center, which was actually even more systematic and wonderful. And these were all assimilated into the main library. Um, this one was not assimilated in the sense that it wasn't mixed in with other books on, on various shelves. It got its own kind of bookcase of its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was the Peter Millwood collection. And the last I heard it was still there. So theoretically, if someone gains permission, they could have access to that co uh, collection for research. Or... Yes, but he never collected books in the, um, I mean, he didn't collect, it's not a collection of early modern books, let's be clear about it. It's a collection of um, writings on the uh, Reformation from Daubigny, you know, sort of 18th, 19th, 19th, well, Daubigny, 19th century, but possibly uh, some of the early ones might have been late 18th. Um, and fairly systematic in that sense. He had pretty much, if it, was a, if it was on the Reformation, especially on the Catholic side of the Reformation, he probably had it. He had all of the um, recusant, you know, the, the uh, reprint recusant publications. So uh, to that extent, he had a large amount of recusant literature uh, in, in reprint editions. Yeah. Well, so it probably if you have access to, say, the Bodleian or the UL at uh, Cambridge or one of the uh, large research libraries in the States, uh, you, you might be able to find these editions. However, it, within Japan, uh, I think it might be very difficult to find many of the things she collected around in other universities, particularly all gathered in one place like that. Yeah. 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 Well, you are uh, you are a antiquary and a collector of books, as you just showed us with uh, Clark's. Uh, and uh, there's quite a lot we have been doing at my university. We've been working with the Folger Library to digitize our uh, small but very good special collections of uh, in uh, focus, with a focus on Bibles, uh, mostly in Latin. But from uh, we have an in Cunabula, we have um, uh, you know one of the uh, post Gutenberg uh, versions of the Jerome uh, Jerome Bible that we finished and it's it's on display at the at the Folger, and I know that you have been busy uh, digitizing your own uh, yeah. collection, and uh, how is yeah. that going? I invested in this scanner which you see sitting over there. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a lovely, elegant little piece of work, and I uh, just this morning was. Um, scanning uh, something called the Gunpowder Treason. Well, John Hawks, Guy Hawks, what am I talking about? Guy, Guy, Guy Hawks. Guy yeah. Hawks. And um, I was thinking of another, another writer, actually, but uh, John Donne has, of course, his famous John, uh, yeah, sermon yeah, that yeah. followed that, that right. has been digitized and dramatized as it could have happened from the pulpit at Paul's Cross in right. uh, at St. Paul's cathedral the outdoor preaching pulpit so mm -hmm. i'm uh, i'm greatly interested in that gun gunpowder plot uh has a you know developed a history of its own that still is out there of course very right a celebrated kind of semi-holiday or in uh to this day yeah uh, yeah remember, and, uh, remember the 5th of november yes yes, yes. Yeah. which uh, which shakespeare would have known all about i mean he'd have lived oh, yeah. through all of that yeah oh yeah 
and uh, this this uh, desire to blow up things, uh, which uh, before before Guy Fawkes, probably fifty years before, I think Somerset uh, in the protectorate, you know, between uh, Henry and Mary, at the roughly the end of the fifteen forties, uh, there was some blowing up of the office of rebels. Uh, he blew up a section of it. I don't know why. And I think there was uh, an explosion. They took down some buildings at in St. Paul's, uh, but I'm not sure as I'm, I know that they, uh, they, they destroyed buildings and now how much by uh, gunpowder, I'm not sure. It's a uh, quick, quick and easy way. They wanted to preserve the stones to use them in Somerset's case for Somerset Palace. Uh, Guy, Guy Fawkes had some uh, more kind of apocalyptic visions of what he wanted to accomplish. <laughs> just, just blow it all up. And I think, John, you know more than I do. I think he came darn close to succeeding in that effort. Well, there is also the issue of whether there were actually agents provocateurs in there um, styming it from the beginning. And of course, there was the uh, the letter of one of the conspirators to a family member who was a politician, which is what gave the game away, saying "stay away from Parliament on that particular night." Uh, so after that, of course, uh, there was no chance. Yeah. Yeah. So they were forewarned. They. But, but it is amazing that that they could actually rent rent cellars directly under the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> 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 they could actually do that. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, this recent attack on the U.S. Capitol, I think the same sort of thing that nobody expected that to happen from no. that particular group of people. It was, uh, even though there were threats, so there were, you know, in hindsight, it was uh, abundantly clear that something bad could happen. Yeah. I think it just yeah. took them by surprise. No, no one would do that. No one would go down to the cellars and load them up with gunpowder. Uh, no one's going to charge and try to take over the Capitol building. I mean, my goodness, with all of the, but uh, there it is. Uh, yes, there it is. There, there it is. Yeah. Uh, so I wish that I could have helped you with the scanning part of that, but we're just yeah. not allowed to even enter I that know, building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not allowed. Uh, so. But I think it's better that you got your own scanner and learned to I'm use it. I'm a very happy, very happy customer. You know, I, I, I think for consumer satisfaction, you know, forget that hairdryer that you might have been sort of promising <laughs> yourself or forget, forget any, any, you know, that, that little moped that you thought might get you to work a bit quick. Get a scanner. Get a scanner. <laughs> wonderful things. Wonderful things. It's so life, satisfying. <laughs> life is better with the scanner. Well, and you have a very fine one there and yeah, uh, not that expensive yeah. yeah and so you can you can create pdfs uh and those uh, did you tell me you can they're searchable that they're text searchable pdfs text. Yes. wow wow i mean being in early modern english people would have to understand that for you know for example letters u and v and f and s you know mm. if you want to search for pleasure um, spell it with an F in, in, instead of an S in the middle, and then it'll come up. <laughs> yeah, as the technology becomes more uh, uh, intelligent, getting better for machine reading. Of course, you were on with me. We worked together with uh, Angela Davenport and other people to bring Evo, early English books online, to right. Japan. And yeah. we're, we're, fi we're finally victorious uh, in the sense that uh, this gained momentum. And I know that with your book that you relied on Ebo quite a bit to yes. find. Yes. 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 And it's it's not it's not perfect, but it's good enough, you know, for a, a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. And there, there's nothing like it before. No. Uh, I'm going to try to talk to David McGinnis at the Mel University of Melbourne maybe next month, and he works with Lost Plays. Uh, but he wrote a quick little article, I think, and I mentioned it in another podcast about, uh, I think it was for a university publication about how the term wild goose chase uh, is attributed to Shakespeare by the OED, as are many things. With a quick OED search, I, I'm sorry, Ebo search, you find that that was fairly a fairly common phrase. And it's very uh, apparent. And that it, it went kind of viral, that article. That's, uh, and he, uh -huh. he really wasn't expecting it. 
And of course, I brought that up with our mutual friend, Pip Wilcox, who's now with the National Archives. She was very politely said, well, I have friends who are working with the OED, and I believe you me, they have adjusted. And the, the revisions have been made, you know, to be a little bit less Shakespeare centric. Well, uh, yes. You know, uh, you know, a lot less, actually. And so you, there's, uh, there's a lot more there. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really not a mistake on the part of the OED. Those were the books that they had. And, you know, yeah, so much of that literature of the period had fallen into obscurity, which yes. is why, I mean, I found it so useful because I was able to say, OK, let's look at particular search terms and then see what they're actually saying in texts that are not quite so well known and find out what is being systematically said or what kinds of things are cropping up again and again. So obviously it would be very misleading. And I think there are problems with people trying to use that kind of database to get statistical data. Mm. So I think that you have to be very careful about how you interpret statistics, but at the same time to locate references, it, it's a godsend. I mean, we didn't have anything like that until until this came along. Yeah, uh, you can certainly track consciousness, if not um, uh, hardcore empirical statistics. You you can certainly track consciousness, and you can certainly track. And my my, what thrills me, and I'm sure you too, is that you can see the creative process not just in Shakespeare, but in other writers, not how, in what they make up out of the air, how they use materials that were already available and had some kind of. Um, what uh, sh shared knowledge in public, you know, the, the reading public and mm -hmm. how they use those mach materials and integrated them for the, then what is in fact a very original work in many of their cases, it mm -hmm. jumps to mind, Midsummer Night's Dream jumps to mind, you know, so referential of so many things and you can't, you can't point to exactly one thing like you can say with the um, Henry plays in Hollinshed, but uh, the way it's blended and the, the, I don't want to call it a curry, but that mixture, is just, uh, it shows the uh, actual nature of, of the brilliance. If you're looking for brilliance right. in Shakespeare, that's, uh, and many other examples. Yeah. Uh, and so now we can see it uh, a, a, a lot better, uh, if well, not perfectly. Writing the monograph, there's so much overtly said and specifically said uh, during the period about the Protestant scorn for Catholic miracles. And there's, even in books which have so got some very, very sort of shocking aspects of um, self-inflicted suffering or um, penances as the Catholics you know, would call them, um, the Protestant response doesn't really mention that very much. Hmm. So hmm. there's so much that you have to infer and what you find is that you can infer it through the fact that, well, when they're translating it, they, they, they gloss over certain details. Mm -hmm. Or uh, so if they're translating it for a Protestant readership, mm -hmm. it, they, it won't just be purely doctrinal alterations that are made. It, in some cases, Catholic works of devotion get rehashed into uh, works of Protestant fiction, effectively, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more fictionalized because there's no place in Protestant religious discourse for that kind of scene, scenario. But there's also uh, pleasure. And, the, I, and so uh, talk about pleasure and how that fits with pain. And yeah. <laughs> um, well, really, what you're looking at is at the beginning of the 17th century, it's all about suffering, really, because you've got this Protestant doctrine of justification by faith. Now, you may say, well, John, you're going off on a different tangent here, but it's not really, because in order to know that you were saved, how would you know? I and mean, you had to have this faith that God would not let you rot in hell. God would have saved you. God would have written your name in the book of life from the beginning. But how would you know that? What's... And the, really the only ideas that they had about that was that you would be a person who would rejoice to suffer for Jesus Christ. 
this would be, I mean, if you, if you were just suffering but not rejoicing, well, that would be just a foretaste of the hell that's to come. If you were living a life of pleasure, well, hey, you were doomed, you know, when you died, you, all that pleasure would be paid for, you're going to go to, go to hell. The only way to be sure that you were one of the saved was to be a person who rejoiced to suffer. Now, quite a lot of attention has been given to this in recent research, um, the depression that accompanied this. I mean, Shakespeare himself, you know, in Hamlet, you've got a lot of that sort of thing, you know, how weary, flat, stale and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world and so on. Um, if you weren't suffering, you and rejoicing to suffer, you were probably going to go to hell. And this is, the, this is, it's no accident, the books like The Anatomy of Melancholy and the, really the, the first books that are sort of studying introspection and depression. I mean, we wouldn't call it melancholy now, but it's the same thing, really. And by the end of the century, people just aren't thinking like that anymore. I mean, there are a few. I mean, Bunyan is later on in the century, and, and he's, he's one of the Puritan few, really, who takes all of this very seriously. He, 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 he grace abounding to the chief of sinners. He believes that he is doomed. And every, at every turn, he thinks, but I, no, I, I, this doubt arises in his mind, and this doubt arises in his mind. And then he gets arrested and he gets put in prison and he thinks, thank God, thank God I have been chosen to suffer for my Lord. And, uh, and I know, it, 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 I'm, and I may not be presenting it very sympathetically. I mean, the guy actually seriously, and that's how he saw it. He saw it in those terms. So uh, there's there's yeah. pleasure in pain. Well, and that is, pleasure, I guess. You've, you've also got the more, all through the 17th century, you've got a huge amount of uh, reworking of Stoicism and Epicureanism, with Stoicism winning out pretty heavily in the earlier part of the century, and Epicureanism uh, kind of coming in for the last few laps there. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, by the end of the 17th century, you're starting to have ideas like human rights. That's when um, cruel and unusual punishment is used for the first time. In a very ironic, if, I, if you look at it, context, the idea that you should not, there are certain types of suffering that no one should have to go through, no one should have to endure. And that's really the beginning of the end of things like hanging, you know, being hanged, drawn and quartered or, or the terrible ways in which people were mutilated before they were actually put to death and this sort of thing yeah, by yeah. the state. Yeah, by the end of the century, you've got much more of a, it's much more a world of coffee houses. It's a much more urbane world. The coffee house is frankly beginning to replace the church as the center of many people's lives. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got this move away from a, a rather dour way of looking at things, which, all right, not everybody was dour, as Shakespeare said, because thou art virtuous, shall there be no more cakes and ale? You know, there were plenty of people who were out to have fun yeah. in those days as well, yeah. in the Elizabethan period and the early Stuart period. But by the end of the century, it's become much more normative. So that's the other thing that the book traces, they kind of shift from, uh, well, you've got to suffer, and you've yeah. got to rejoice to suffer to, well, actually that, that, that's starting to sound a bit perverse by the end of the 17th century in Protestant discourse, yeah. which is well, the, the third aspect of the title, pain, pleasure, and perversity. Yeah, I'm glad you made that distinction because really the era that you're talking about toward the end uh, is what uh, Habermas talks about in terms of the, the public sphere and the coffeehouse culture yeah. that, that came in toward the end of the 17th century and I remained, you know, for a long time and maybe even still be with us. Uh, yeah. And uh, I know scholars who I think not incorrectly, but they try to take that and plug it into the 16th and early 17th century 
and talk about public sphere research. And there were public spheres, but it's quite different from the one that Habermas was describing and described by so many writers. Uh, and, uh, but there were public spaces that uh, I think uh, at Paul's Cross and of course in the theater that of course you might see some of the seeds of that sort of thing maybe. Uh, but uh, I'm glad you made that distinction. Uh, perversity. Perversity. Now, where does perversity fit into the uh, well, sort that, of trini trinity? Uh, that's really where, as I say, certain religious texts start to be translated in a more sort of fictionalized way. Um, uh, Raiko's translation of uh, Gra uh, Gracian, you've got a, a Spanish Jesuit writing about, um, it's an allegory, okay? Um, but it's not one that has any place, as I say, in Protestant religious discourse, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the um, temptations of the world are represented by uh, really kind of proto-dominatrices. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically what they are. And uh, they, 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 they inveigle people by chains of their own making into the, the inn of the world the inn as in hotel, uh, where they spend many, many years um, be, being, uh, yeah, basically sort of uh, having suffering inflicted on them by these uh, temptresses or whatever you call them, and then they're thrown out of the windows. Um, it's, it's, and it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting how the translation kind of pumps up the more salacious or the more, the, the, the more kind of, yeah, makes it more erotic. The, the Catholic version is very simple and bare bones and very kind of, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's quite extreme to read it, but it's, it's still fairly simple and bare bones. Whereas the uh, Protestant version kind of jazzes it up. You can see he's playing it for those erotic effects. Um, and it's not in a religious text. He's taken it out of a religious context. He's, he's made it um, something much more kind of secular. And th there are quite a lot of texts like this where you can see that the Protestant treatment of those texts is very different from the Catholic treatment because it, it's just too much. It's just too much. It had to be, um, I don't want to say censored, but maybe toned down a bit, <laughs> dialed down a bit to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, to fit probably kind of a, a, a growing middle class taste of people who, you know, a, a new class of reader coming into this who really could not handle some of the graphic. Uh, you, what you're talking about reminds well, me of uh, the books. Yeah. It's not so much that they couldn't handle it. I think there was a tremendous interest in that, that, that you do get some, some very, very harsh writings about suffering by, by well people like Nash for example is very good at writing about that oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, you've got quite a few writers who are, who are very good at uh, describing really gory and gruesome things I mean our friend Shakespeare was pretty good at it when he turned yeah. his mind to it you know? some of his uh, Jacobean contemporaries I'm thinking John Webster and the Dutch well, yes. Coffee, yes. and uh, yeah and on the stage you know uh, and yeah. people uh, clamored, I'm, I'm certain, clamored for tickets to watch the spectacle yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, perverse, really, perverse suffering yes. uh, that is inflicted upon uh, someone who's really an innocent, as, as you would, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so the spectacle of suffering, the, uh, you, you, and, and you've got some interesting works coming out by, by women at this time. You've got Mary Roth, um, you've got uh, Alfred Ben, and they're writing it in a very kind of yeah, a close to the bone kind of way about all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, what's interesting is that it, it, that it cannot really be incorporated into a religious context anymore. Or oh, you've got this early account of an early Christian who's being uh, taken in, in, in Jerome, taken um, into a beautiful garden, tied down to a bed and uh, mounted by a, 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 a prostitute. And as she bends down to kiss him, he bites off his tongue and spits it in her face. Oh. Now, the Catholic translations of this Latin text 
So I've, I tapped my fingers on the table. <laughs> the, Catholic, the Catholic translations of this Latin, Latin text put it into the vernacular more or less verbatim. All of the Protestant editions all across Europe, all across Europe, not, not just in England, but all across Europe, expurgate it hugely. They cannot, they just really cannot find a way to tell this story as a, as a religious text. They, they expurgate it. They cut out many of the details, most of the details, and just give a very, very, you know, sometimes they don't even explain very clearly the visual situation. Um, it clearly made them uncomfortable. It sort of Baudelarized it before, long before Thomas Baudelaire came around. Yeah, yeah, yeah a bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, Latin. The Latin text would be there, and would be. And, and it's interesting that the first pornographic works that appeared were also written in Latin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's an idea that, like, we can't let the plebs get hold of this. It's all right for us, but we can't yeah. let the plebs get hold of this stuff. Um, yeah. It just wouldn't be right. And the Latin language dislocates it a bit because it's not the vernacular. Uh, yeah, but still, uh, it's pretty. It's pretty close to the bone. A lot of that. In fact, well, it's yeah. <laughs> using the word bone there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With a bit of a double entendre. Uh, that word. Do you know that double entendre doesn't exist in French? A double sense. Double we say it in English, but uh, French people have been outraged when I've said that. We don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought I thought I was sounding kind of sophisticated when I, I talked about that and tried no, it's, to it's, pronounce, it's, it's pronounce it somewhere it's close to it's not French French. <laughs> what the French would pronounce it. Well, that's good. Well, that goes up uh, on the list with French fries. Neither <laughs> are they French either. Well, this is something I could talk to, with you for hours on, but I think our listeners have a, a good idea of the type of approach that you took, that you take in uh, in terms of your research in uh, the the early modern period and uh, your book and onward. And but I want to focus on your work now. You are retired, but you really aren't because I'm looking in YouTube here and you 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 run a site uh, called Ano Sensei. Yeah. Which for people who are not uh, involved with Japanese culture, that would be a, a student asking you politely to explain something. You know, they start out with Ano Sensei, and yeah. there's, some, uh, there's some humor in the title of the site, uh, Ano being a kind of transitional word. Uh, well, I kind of saw it, see it as a bit like kind of, hey, teacher, you know, yeah. and the, early, the early videos I had, you know, the student going to going, Ano sensei and me going ano nani like so what, what yeah go on what <laughs> yeah go on what yeah. um, so, um, uh, so that has turned into over I think you've been doing this now for what three or three three years now three yeah. years and uh, for a total of uh, of quite a few videos here I uh, saw it posted here I'm at your site and um, the thing is you're doing uh, language literature history. And that's what you do. And yeah. in language, you go into, it's, I think, with some wonderful specifics with graphs and so forth that uh, would rival a beat, I think, uh, most textbooks out there in terms of uh, explication of, of uh, something as simple as the pronunciation of L and R, how to do that a bit better, right? And transitional uh, yeah. uh, gra grammar, I'm not transitional, uh, but uh, you know the uh, transformational grammar, transformational, yeah, yeah. yeah, transformational grammar, and uh, very very sophisticated. I think uh, looks uh, that that speak toward very practical pedagogy, right? And and practical understanding of how to improve your English today. At least this small part, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you've gotten wonderful reception there. And um, yeah, you have a separate grammar uh, and pronunciation. Those are split out for as different categories. Right. Um, and they are uh, of varying degrees of popularity uh, and, uh, and the wase ego, the kind of strange <laughs> way the English is appropriated into the language, which yeah. I think yeah. I've seen a couple of those that are very funny. And what surprised me about this site is, uh, 
you would think that your audience, once you're out there, would be more drawn to the practical English. And in our teaching careers, we there's been a strong force out there that we always sort of push back against a bit. Uh, because they would like to strip off all the varnish uh, off the wood, you know, and just say, you know, like business English, just teach them words they'll have to use in the hotel business. And you yeah. go, they might have to use a lot of words in the hotel, but it's the English language, you know, the, uh, the English for specific purposes and, yeah. uh, and, and that sort of thing. And there's some value to uh, paring it down and looking at things very specifically. And you would think that's where the student particularly student interest and also many adults in Japan who are striving to keep to improve their English, you think that that's where they would be drawn to, you know, yeah. kind of how to side. And you did a, you've done a series of poetry videos that are just killing it. You're they are getting, exponentially uh, more popular. Yes, yes. Thousands of views, tens of thousands of views, yes, yes. you know, are sort of a tsunami over the practical English side, which is oh, doing very well. Yeah. But I can't, uh, John Keats, Ode to a Nightingale, uh, I think is your number one right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, with 33,000 views. Yeah. My yeah. goodness. And then next, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. Now, yeah. you know, if I had to pick my top five British poems, those two would be in the top five for certain. Yeah. But I didn't know how many other people out there, uh, uh, you know, were interested in watching a you know, 15 minute video or so. Mm. Um, and your Gerard Manley Hopkins, which he is not quite as well known, you know, you as ubiquitous as the other two. Yeah. Those of us in the biz know him. Yeah. Uh, that's done extremely well. Yeah. And, um, and your ode on a Grecian urn is picking up. So, <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a- Not there quite so long, but it's, it's uh, getting- a, yeah. yeah, and you just okay. did, uh, Milton's Lycidas, uh, which uh, I thought was just wonderful. It reminded me of uh, Look Homeward Angel. That's the source for the title of a book by a Southern writer in the early 20th century, Thomas Wolfe, who was very, very celebrated in my educational training in uh, kind of liberal arts, but Southern environment. He was uh, very much um, uh, reified as one of the greats uh, there with Faulkner and, and others. And yeah. maybe it's fallen off a bit, but uh, he, he pulled it straight from Lycidas, which, you know, this ambiguous poem, but yeah. the way that you present these with uh, graphics and explanations uh, and, and nice visuals is uh, alluring, it's, it engages uh, people. And I would be delighted to try to find out, to break down who these thousands of people are. Are they students in high school? Are they re retired folks who just want to learn more about Keeks? Who, who do you? Okay, I'll, I'll, I can explain about the demographics of that, of that um, channel. They are mostly young, nearly all are, are under the age of 35, and well over half are under the age of 25. There's a preponderance of female viewers, although that seems to be balancing itself out a little bit more these days. And India and Italy are the two main viewing countries. Uh, I, I can see, you know, both, both of those in a way. I can see that they have a strong interest in the culture and in the poetry of the culture. So I'm not entirely surprised, but also I have been using translated captions, translated subtitles, so that um, people, especially language like Italian, Arabic, uh, a, lo a lot of uh, viewers or a fair number of viewers are coming in and watching with Arabic subtitles. And the comments that I'm getting are very often from, yeah, that kind of background rather than, say, the United States or Britain or Japan, although I occasionally get comments from from those kinds of backgrounds as well. May I ask, do you do the auto-generated, like if you're doing Arabic, do you just auto-generate the Arabic? I do, and I, I am aware, especially because I do Spanish and other languages that I do speak, and I'm aware that the uh, AI uh, gets it wrong sometimes. Yeah. Um, 
and where I, where I spot an egregious mistake, I, I go in and manually correct it. But uh, it's too much to try and correct everything. But I think just having it there gives enough comprehensibility to what otherwise might be rather challenging to make it uh, worthwhile for those for those people who choose to view it with subtitles, which international subtitles, I think now uh, in, uh, in languages other than English are probably accounting for some 20% of all people who do use subtitles. Yeah. Well, as, as you know, we're trying to get our, uh, if, some, if not all, of our conversations in this series mm -hmm. translated into Japanese because we're doing it from Tokyo, we're doing it to, with yeah. a grant from the Japanese government, from institutional support from uh, my university. And uh, it's just a, as, a, as a courtesy, you know, b because mm. uh, most of the people in Japan who would be wa interested in this would be able to manage well over 90% uh, in yeah. with, with the help of English subtitles, right? right. Um, and some absolutely perfectly, you know, in, in a native fashion. But yeah. uh, uh, some younger people, students might feel more comfortable having the help of the, what they call jimaku. But yeah. it is a, I didn't know it was gonna be, it's been a challenge. It's been a bit of a, uh, it just in terms of time, yeah. And when you have a, a couple of young people, as I do on this project, working on that, uh, time is money. We, we, have to, we have to pay these young people, uh, of course, for their effort. And so I, I don't know, it might come down to, it, it might be too forbidding to do everything. And also, you have to wait for a while for the Japanese subtitles to get out. Uh, but I think we're going to do, a, uh, certainly do several uh, key uh, ones. Yeah. And particularly our Japanese scholars, uh, Japanese nationals. Uh, oh, and I need to mention at this point that you are uh, you are on the menu here because of all the things you've done. But you also have joined us as a uh, a foreign national who has taught in Japan for many years. That's a genre of scholar in our world, right? Because you, I, I'm, I'm in the same uh, business. So I, along with interviewing Japanese scholars, uh, I want to make sure that we include uh, the, uh, the unique experiences of people who have moved here and uh, are immigrants, so to, so to speak, uh, that, and adapting to the Japanese system, which sometimes uh, is wonderful and sometimes isn't so wonderful. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's good to hear your voice on, on that. I think you'll find that the subtitles, Tom, are going to be very uh, well received. Uh, if, if one goes to a Shakespeare performance here in Japan, it's likely to either be in Japanese, but they'll put up English subtitles, yeah. or it'll be in English and they'll put up Japanese subtitles. And this is true for a lot of uh, productions here in Japan. They're used to the idea of having things, um, live theater performances with uh, subtitles. Yeah. So uh, it, I, think, I think that really would make a difference to the way the videos were received here in Japan, yes. Or, or in, you know, in London, if you go to an opera or in New York or, or somewhere, if you go to an opera and they have the subtitles <laughs> out there, it makes the whole thing a whole, a whole lot better. People yes. make jokes and, you know, uh, yeah whatever, the, the magic flute or whatnot, because Mozart had this wonderful sense of humor along with the right. music that fits with it that you don't pick up uh, if you're not, uh, really you have to be a native speaker of, guess, of, yeah. Yeah, of um, Italian mostly, but I think it will add rich, richness and I think the AIs will get better and better, of course. Uh, they already have. I, they are getting better, yes. Yeah, they are getting they're better. growing up fast. They're like a, a child who suddenly you walk in and they're, you know, two or three years older uh, after a month, so. But you realize there are hurdles that AI can probably never really no. fully no. Uh, overcome. No. For instance, the way your, your name, Yamamoto Wilson, you'd have to teach the, the AI to pick up the Japanese name and the English name within an English context or within a Japanese context. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, how do you tell the machine, what do you do the, in, on the Japanese side, do you put this in katakana 
uh, or do you have kanji and then Wilson in katakana? Yeah. Right. Or do you or, or do you just go? We're going to go romaji on this because we're that smart and. And you see a, a, a Japanese person would instantly just look at the situation and say, oh, well, he's Western. He's, he's clearly not Japanese. Uh, the assumption would be that he was not born in Japan, um, yeah. that he's uh, therefore he's a foreigner and therefore his name should be in Kana. Yeah, yeah. You know, that would be, or they would but, but how would AI come to that conclusion? How would I, AI have any any idea about how to make those kinds of assumptions. Oh yeah, and millions of examples, really, when we, when we begin to think about it, millions. But if you get over 90%, you've gone a long, long, long way. Yeah. Uh, and if the rest of it isn't just ridiculous. Uh, mm -hmm. I tried to watch a movie, an old um, American movie, you may know it, Cool Hand Luke, which is a, uh, one of my favorites. It's a prison movie, but it's about redemption and it's about sacrifice and, and has all those themes. And it's extraordinarily humorous and played through with these character actors who have these wonderful um, uh, idioms, you know, the Southern idioms. And the uh, AI was trying to translate it. I, they didn't have uh, subtitles in Japanese uh, that were actually done professionally. Right. And, you know, uh, it, where, where are you going, boy? What do you think you're doing around here? That, absolutely no idea what this guy was saying. The Southern uh, prison kind of warden or, or boss, they called him, you know. Right. And, uh, they, would, they would translate boss as shacho. But your boss on a work crew in a prison farm, of course, that's a whole different meaning. Mm -hmm. And we, we made it about five minutes. She said, I don't understand what, anything that's going on here. <laughs> and, and it's uh, such a shame. But eventually, I hope there will be resources to do both. You know, you bring your AI in and then you have someone else come in and clean it up. Yeah. And I have actually done Japanese and uh, sorry, uh, Spanish and uh, yes, I've done a Japanese version of one video. I've done a Spanish and Italian video of a couple of others. Yeah. Well, of course, the uh, what romance uh, languages are a little bit closer, actually a, a huge amount, a lot, lot closer. What I want to do here, though, is to segue a little bit into I wanted to comment and probably too far into the program to be uh, to have been uh, completely polite to you, but to comment to our viewers uh, that you were an enormous help when I was trying to set up this series. I had a grant and no way to spend the money. And I thought, well, maybe we can do a series of interviews, but I really don't know where to start. And so I had to start from scratch, you know, through uh, learning how to record, try to get some uh, sound quality and 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 you were extraordinarily helpful and I hope you continue to be. I'm going to uh, try to encourage you in in every way because you were ahead of, of me on this. You uh, have been doing this and I, I've been involved with some other well teaching. I, I still have to teach and, I, and I'm trying to get a couple of articles written and that sort of thing. But this uh, pandemic forced me into at least doing that and you helped me along. Right. I love teaching, obviously, and that's why I wouldn't be making those Anno Sensei videos if I didn't love teaching. It's obvious that uh, uh, we talked about academic stuff in the first half of this interview, um, and then we talked about this much more pedagogically oriented stuff with these videos. And that's, uh, to me, it's a very, very important side of things. To the extent that uh, I might write one, one or two more academic papers before I hang up my, what do, what do you hang up, your hat? You will. <laughs> <laughs> before I pop my clogs in the English idiom. Uh, I like that one. Yeah, the popping would be to pawn, you know, to set, take, take to the pawn shop, you know, to take to the oh, PBW oh, pawn yeah. shop. You know, yeah. and, uh, how, how does the uh, AI translate that into Japanese? Goodness knows, but uh, you, I, I don't think they have the concept of such shops here, but uh, the, the, the last thing you would get rid of would be your clogs. Yeah, yeah. Only if you knew you were going to die would you would you finally yeah. pop the clogs. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, um, well, John, let's don't die yet. I want to talk a little bit more about your youth and what led you to Japan and led you into uh, 
led you into humanity, studies into humanities and language and that sort of thing. And I think you told me you were you went to a regular old school in uh, the south of England, where you were born and grew up. Uh, you didn't go to Eton, uh, I don't think. And, uh, and you were qualifying for university. And there was a, a little bit of a I guess it's another uh, Brit turn. It was a little bit of a cock up in there. Something didn't quite go right, or the time uh, was a little off. No, it was fairly straightforward. I mean, I, I my parents moved around quite a bit. Uh -huh. uh, my father was an academic. Okay, he was a, a university teacher, so um, that also also explains a fair bit of how I ended up as I am. Um, so we moved around a bit as he was going up his career ladder. And uh, my last couple of years of schooling were sort of what we call sixth form, the last two years of what you now call house, high, what you call high school in America yeah. and English and what the British are now starting also to call high school. Yeah. And um, we had these tests called A-levels and you had to get a certain number of A-levels in order to be able to go to university. But you would apply to the university, or to a series of universities before taking the A-level exams. And then I and several others that year um, got better than expected results and along with worse than expected offers before um, taking the exams, before taking the A-levels. So the headmaster said, look, you people, you've got um, good results and you don't have offers that really match those results. Uh, why don't you stay on for an extra term and do Cambridge and Oxford entry? So we did. Several of us, a number of us did. Yeah. And oh, so there was nothing messed up about that. It was just that... Uh, well, if you'd been going to uh, one of the elite schools like Eton, uh, yeah. you'd have done your Oxbridge before doing your uh, uh, A-levels. Right. So we see. Because this was just a regular, you know, county grammar school. Uh, they weren't in gear for that kind of thing. So we just stayed on for an extra term afterwards. So you're, uh, you, you have the ability, though, at that point to retreat uh, for a period and then come back in and, and get things in the right order. Uh, the way it worked out was that uh, we, we got those exam results in the summer for the A-levels. We yeah. stayed on until Christmas. And just before Christmas, we took the Cambridge and Oxford entry exams yes um but of course we were then being accepted for the following autumn yes okay so you had to fill in that time and i think that's when you ended up somehow in barcelona yes I, I, I was very lucky to get a teaching job a, a nice teaching job uh working at a school for uh, students with, uh, from the regular main school were coming in for an english class after the main classes had finished. So from five o'clock to nine o'clock every evening, for four hours a day, I was teaching English conversation and I had my days free up until that time. I, I had my weekends free. Um, so I had a wonderful time in it. Yeah, plenty of money, not, not I, overflowing with it, but plenty to get by. Well, things were so cheap, Tom. I know, <laughs> they still are in some places. You, you, you learned a language. You learned a language in that period, or yes, you... I had already taken Spanish as a school subject, so I I spoke some Spanish, but not very well. And then I I found that I had an affinity for it. Yeah. Um, and yes, so I, I had a, a great time there. And then after graduating from Cambridge, I had a, a total sense of anticlimax because I had not thought in the slightest about what I would do afterwards. <laughs> And I really, I just had not thought at all about what I would do when I graduated. But you had chosen to go the path where you were an English major, would you call it that? Uh, yeah. 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 And English so, meaning, of course, English literature. English literature. And, and very English. I mean, you might look at the old Scot or the old Welsh, but I scarcely even at the Irish. No oh, wait, okay. We're saying, yes, in England, uh, yes. English uh, literature was very geographically determined. We didn't we didn't look at colonial literature, post-colonial literature, or anything like that. Yeah, straight uh, up, uh, Tennyson. I think things would have changed by now, you know, obviously, I don't think suppose it would be the same kind of thing now, but I'm sure. it, it was very uh, English-English. 
Yeah, uh, not, not uh, any uh, what picks from the uh, uh, from the pick tradition in the north in the uh, Scottish North or the Breton uh, tradition over in uh, Wales. Uh, no, it had to be Anglo-Saxon conquered by the Norse Norsemen. Combination of those. Uh, I'm, I'm being facetious. I'm actually referencing one we, of the we, videos. We started really with like you know Langland and the Pearl Poet and Chaucer, and we just went through at a kind of rate of a major author or major kind of topic a week um, until we got up to the present day. But we didn't we didn't really look outside uh, what what was English English literature. I went back to Spain for a few months. Um, at this time, it wasn't such a good job, and uh, I wasn't so happy with the whole thing. So I, I came back to England thinking, well, this is it. I'm going to do a, a I'm going to start on postgraduate studies, which I did again at Cambridge. And within oh a year or so, my supervisor had died. Oh, yeah. oh. This is uh, any of you out there who are contemplating <laughs> to, to <laughs> doing a PhD is not on the list that of most people's priorities, but do please make sure that your supervisor is in good health and is likely to last for uh, at least the next five years, let's say. Yeah, break into his or her house and remove all the unhealthy food from the refrigerator <laughs> and make sure if there's any tobacco around to remove that. And there was something wrong with his ear and he had some sort of infection and I spoke to him on the phone. He said he wasn't going to be able to take the car and take, take, to supervise me. And I said, well, take care of yourself and get well soon. And he said, well, I certainly don't intend to die of it. And that was the last I ever heard of him. And he did. He, he um, did die of it. I have a, a great uncle, you know, one step up, who was at Columbia and had finished his dissertation. And uh, his advisor died. And they put in the next guy. And the next guy said, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to. And it had already been approved by the guy who did die. Right. And uh, so he said, you're just going to have to do some more work here. And I think my uncle said, I, I know more about this than you do. And I'm, I'm leaving. I can't, I don't have the time to, to do this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't think in current, in the current environment, it would be quite that bad. I think someone who stepped in would be more inclined to. Uh, well, you, know. you know, the person who stepped in for me was, uh, you know, he, he, he wasn't, bad he just wasn't really a specialist in that particular area so I was working on the Spanish literature as it was translated into England during the early modern period yeah um, also the English department at that time uh, I think well all hell broke loose now which famous uh, novelist uh, David Lodge talks yes. about all hell all hell breaking loose in the English department at Cambridge. Yes. One young lecturer losing his job and the whole the whole thing going kind of all because of like Marxist approaches to literature and you know um, new historicism and so on and the traditional school and a big conflict. So you've got this kind of civil war going on and there's poor Johnny Boy doing this uh, comparative literature topic, which has suddenly gone out of fashion and. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out that in any civil war, you have to be on one side or the other. Yeah. And I wasn't on it either side. So yeah. the, <laughs> the traditionalist <laughs> camp interviewed me, or you know, they gave me my uh, viva on the PhD as I submitted it initially. And they made it clear that they weren't very happy. I think they thought I was some kind of newfangled rebel or something, or I don't know, the things I was saying were quite outrageous or I don't know what. Um, and then I uh, resubmitted it, and this time I got the new, the other side of. <laughs> oh. I got Lisa Jardine and a bunch of the. Uh, the I got the, the the new criticism kind of. Yeah. Thing. So partly I think I messed up the interview, but also they didn't quite know what to make of me, and they didn't yeah. accept it. So twice it was turned down, um, which is pretty much unheard of. I don't think that would happen today. Uh, did you did you go back to Spain after that happened? Is that I, I I went to the south of Spain and I really put academia in the bottom drawer and I I just in, focused on enjoying life, mixing yeah. with people, having a good time, what doing yeah. a bit of teaching here, playing a bit of music here, doing some translating here and interpreting just to yeah. make ends meet. But yeah. basically, just 
I, I think, you know, it's not happy going through something like that, not knowing really what's going to happen. Uh, I had some wonder some, uh, a few, let's say three or four years uh, in, the, in a similar thing. It wasn't because of being of an advisor dying or something, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I look back on those years now, and I'm, I'm just very happy knowing all the other people that I know that I had that experience. Yeah. That, you know, however, if I had not pivoted out of that, they've gotten stuck somehow, it may not have been a happy uh, thing. Uh, yeah. And and you went back at one point and got qualified in uh, uh, in linguistics, a TESOL degree or, or something. I, I, I took a, a master's in applied linguistics thinking yeah, that it does look, John, as if you are gravitating more and more to the situation where the only way you could really make some you know, not not you know, just even a modest amount of money is by teaching languages, teaching yeah. them in English and to a certain extent French or Spanish. But so you uh, qualified there, and then now, how did you end up in Japan? Well, the I, I got a job at a very good language school, which paid not terribly <laughs> good money, but was a very enjoyable place to work, and uh, it had a sister university or it had a relationship with a, a university in Japan. Yeah. So there were all these Japanese students who were coming over. Mm -hmm. And I found that these students were very often not popular with uh, many of the other teachers who would find it very difficult. They would ask the Germans a question and the Germans would give an opinion and say things. They'd ask Italians and the Italian, they couldn't shut the Italians up. But the Japanese, they. <laughs> They said, it looks as if they were going to answer. And, 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 uh, and then they turned to each other and started talking in Japanese. <laughs> they didn't know how to get a response out of them. Well, I, it turned out that I was quite good at getting a response out of them and, the, and breaking the ice and establishing a friendly rela relationship where they, they, they opened up and they talked about all kinds of things. And um, very strong encouragement from them. John, you should go to Japan. John, you should go to Japan. <laughs> uh, one thing led to another, and I did, I did, I did come to Japan. To cut a long story short, and, uh, and you stayed, and you stayed, and I stayed, yes. and you managed to uh, get a position at a at one of the elite universities here yeah. in Japan, in Tokyo, and then you did finish your uh, uh, doctoral degree. And, uh, Finally, yes, when they gave me that sabbatical year, yeah. I, uh, I, as, as you know, I wrote that monograph and then um, I put the monograph together with uh, several other papers that I'd written, including one on Shakespeare and Catholicism, um, sent them all off to Cambridge in a cardboard box and they, uh, they interviewed me and gave me the PhD with very little hesitation, they said this is really yeah. well. Oh, it's very fine. Well, <laughs> yeah. It was earned and not given. It was very fine work, and uh, and I, I like the I, I like the gumption of it. You know, well, uh, ne never give up because you didn't have to do that. You could have continued, you know, but, all the way to re in retirement and probably. Yes, but there was pressure for me to get a PhD and I think there was a feeling that I would do as Peter Miller did and get it through Sophia University. Uh, he was an Oxford an undergrad. Uh, he was an Oxford undergrad but he did his PhD at Sophia and I just somehow felt no it's going to be Cambridge or, or bust. I want those people to take it to take, not exactly take it back but I want them to realize that you know I was working on something and I had something to say there. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't manage to say it to their satisfaction back in those days, uh, it, it wasn't because there wasn't anything there. Yeah. So uh, I took it back all those years later. Uh, even before the interview began, they said, we just want you to know we really like your stuff. <laughs> so, it was such a different experience from my previous two uh, oh, oh, oh. examinations. <laughs> And then, I was very relieved, yes. Yeah, and then a long career at Sophia. And of course, the, Japan has gone through some growing pains uh, be, doing what is called, you know, here's Kokusaika, the um, internationalization. There's been a lot of pressure from uh, all the right kinds of people and for the right kinds of reasons to, to uh, internationalize, to make sure. And one large part of that is 
developing your English skills and uh, sometimes to the disadvantage of people who would like to bring cultural uh, awareness, critical thinking, you know, the things that you need uh, that are cross languages, and but also prohibit someone from getting a good grasp of the language they're studying if you don't uh, include them. And so that, that leads to sometimes a little bit of discontent within departments. You have people who are a little more utilitarian and want to drive forward. And I found that those people usually want to seek power uh, <laughs> a little bit more than I, I ever had, you know, and institutional yeah. power, kind of small power and can, well, can be a little bit. From the highest political levels that, you know, the humanities are not useful. Yeah. And, and what they don't seem to realize is that, of course, the humanities are useful. Yeah. I mean, not just not just in the in like it is a sort of some sort of ephemeral treasure or a benefit to the individual and of no benefit to society. But there is research that shows that people who read books commit suicide less than people who don't read books. People who read books get depressed less than people who they take less time off sick. They contribute more to the workforce. They are better happier, more positive members of society. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it really is very, very short-sighted to be yeah. saying uh, it, it, it should just be functional and utilitarian. And, and also, I want to remind them, when we say they, we're not talking just about Japanese. I've had this experience. No, no, no. This is, this is a worldwide. American universities. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is worldwide. Uh, there seems to be a certain, uh, I, I think in Japan, it might feel a little stronger because I think in post-war Japan, there, there was a, uh, a do or die mentality. I mean, we have to, we have to cut out all of the, um, uh, what, it, what do you call it, the dressing and uh, the window dressing and all of this stuff. We got to get buildings built. We got to get sewers built. We have to get water in here that's clean and healthy. We got to get engineers who can do all of that and do it uh, effectively. And that still sort of drives things. Uh, you, you can see, uh, uh, in in Tokyo, quite a lot. When uh, when now it doesn't necessarily have to, and we've had the we've had the great benefit of making friends with so many people who are Japanese who are just spot on with us about the value of of cultural uh, of of cultural education of learning Shakespeare uh, mm -hmm. on on so many levels, you know. Uh, and so, you know, we, we often try to make the argument, well, it, it also helps people in business to be, to know something about Romeo and Juliet. Well, that's a weak argument. You can get through your entire life and, and make <laughs> millions and millions of dollars. But then uh, so there's so many times when you see people who are successful in business, particularly in the areas of technology uh, and so forth. And they're quite, uh, they're quite big on humanistic learning. You find out they're readers and uh, they're well-spoken, they're articulate, and uh, they have sensibility, and they are business leaders, and that's one of the reasons they, they are. So, uh, but I always come back to public demand. You know, there's no university in the world that if you announced from tomorrow onward, we're no longer teaching Shakespeare, and along with that, Keats and Shelley and everybody else, we're no longer doing that. And no Japanese authors, no French authors, no Italian authors. We're not doing it. It's just not practical. Would that help the university? Would, would the public image, and I'm talking about John Q, uh, even you know working class uh, guys and so forth, they go, well, no Shakespeare at Oxford. Well, I just don't know if the Oxford's as good as it used to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. it would probably have a terrible effect. And they get it so cheaply. I'm, I'm uh, going on a little bit of a, a sermon here, you know, <laughs> my, my gunpowder sermon. But public demand is so apparent, and it's great business. It is great business. It can be. Uh, it can draw in so many people so cheaply, and 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 give you the give you the window dressing and make your place more attractive than the next if you're a university competing for students or whatnot. But we lived through some of those, um, and not culture wars. In, in fact. That, that was kind of what was happening at Cambridge when you were coming through was actually cultural war. It was, yeah, yeah. That still is out there. And some of these points are still salient that uh, are, were being brought up back in the day. Yeah. And, uh, we're, we're really in a competition between, uh, I don't know, the, the, the utilitarians and 
the other people who we are. I don't know what to call us. <laughs> Some, some people would call us snowflakes, but I don't, I don't view myself as much of a snowflake. I would love to carry this forward and so forth, John. I think that we've kind of covered it. We've and, covered uh, most, of the, most of the ground here. Yeah. yeah, and I do want to emphasize again, anyone who sees this, to please visit Ano Sensei. It's easy. Just put it into YouTube search. It would be better than Google. Uh, but it would come up on Google and just look around and shop. There are a few videos in there. If you if you want to learn something more about uh, 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 Keats' uh, Ode to a Nightingale, you're going to get a great one. And if you want to learn uh, something about better pronunciation of certain English words, uh, and and I should say when I should say, uh, I shouldn't leave that out there. There is no perfect way to pronounce English words, you know, your accent and mine are entirely different. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but we, we just want people to be able to understand. That's all. Yeah. And yeah, it just at some point it gets to be difficult to understand what the word is, and you want to keep it inside that area. Uh, so we're not privileging, uh, because there are dialects. I mean, there's a way a, a, a person born in, and, and raised in France will, will speak English that you can recognize as a French English accent, yeah, and yeah. perhaps a Northern European or a Spanish. But uh, and there's, there's nothing wrong with having an accent. I, no, it's beautiful. Everybody's got an accent. Of Everybody's got an accent, and I love it. Sometimes, they, you know, to hear uh, an Italian speak. Uh, I was listening to a podcast, and he was speaking in English, and it was just so lyrical. It brought yeah. a lot of beauty to you know his the, the language that he's bringing from the Italian. That Italian sounds yeah. lovely. But if you want to learn better, a uh, little bit better pronunciation to be understood, practical English that will help you in your in your job and help you advance in your career. That's a, that's uh, available there too. Uh, along with history, I didn't mention before, and I, I just, uh, I just loved your bit on the uh, pre-William the Conqueror, because uh, yes, I, that's, that's I knew everything in bits yeah, and pieces. I knew all of this, but I realized when I watched it that it wasn't clear in my mind who went yeah. where on the map. I knew that yeah. there were picks in Scotland before there were, you know, uh, uh, and yeah. that, that Wales. I didn't know that Wales was primarily Breton. I, I wasn't quite sure about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't know about the Indo-European -Euro tribes that came in before the Ang Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, and uh, and then the the exact place of the Dan Danish of uh, Daneland, I think it yeah. was called in the old text. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I think some of that is still up for grabs. So it's still, you know, from a genetic point of view and, and various points of view, they're still trying to figure out exactly what the composition of the British is. Absolutely people fascinating. Is but it's fascinating. But, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not all cut and dry. Yeah. yeah, but it's where you came from, you very specifically. But if you take that migration, I mean, most of that, you know, uh, came over to the States and I think yeah. more uh, Scottish and uh, uh, Scottish Irish, uh, also what we call Ulster, that there were large migrations very early on that were part of my family background and so right. uh it's just an eternal eternal of eternal interest to so many people and even if you're not invested in that it's just of eternal interest how tribes how things developed into a nation state eventually yeah. Yeah. and uh so uh thank you so much for that i can't wait for your next one uh mm -hmm. history and, uh, yeah, I'm doing. I'm, I'm working on a history one now. I'm working on the Reformation. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm waiting to, waiting to see that. Well, and of course, the Shakespeare series has to has to be added to. It's uh, still very. Uh, yeah, Shakespeare's a uh, Shakespeare's a good uh, keyword out there. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what I want to do is ask you to stay a little bit afterwards, but, but before you leave, I wanted to thank you so much again for to, talking to me today and talking to us, and also for the help that you've given this series. Uh, You're very welcome. And, and, and as, we, as we move along, and thank you so much, and my best to you and yours. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.